Welcome, and thank you for tuning in. We're so glad you joined us. We're doing a special series of messages, and we're taking the time to record uh, our messages and put them up online so that as an assembly, Crossroads Bible Church, we can gather together in our own homes. Uh, everyone is uh, familiar with the COVID-19 virus, and because of the threat of the contagiousness of the virus, uh, we're all being careful to be not having contact, so we're not meeting together on a regular basis. And so we're producing and putting up online these messages so that we can all study God's Word together and continue to grow together. We're really looking forward to when we can all come back together and worship together. In the meantime, let's be looking in God's Word together, encouraging one another and seeking God's blessing each and every day. So let's get right to God's Word. Let's begin the message. I invite you to get your Bible if you don't have it, and I invite you to turn in your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, and uh, I'd like to ask you to follow along as I read the first 13 verses of chapter 1 of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you, through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. Therefore, Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Let's look to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. In times like these, when we face a crisis, and we're facing this pandemic that is going across our land, indeed across the entire globe, people are concerned about the illness that is so easy to catch, not knowing if they have it or if they will get it. And in these times of po the potential for fear, we have your word, Father, your word to lead us, to guide us, to give us truth, to give us instruction, to fill our hearts with comfort and assurance. And so, Father, I pray that as we look into your word this day, that your Holy Spirit will touch the hearts of each and every one of your children, 
strengthen the hearts of each and every one of your children and equip each and every one of your children that we might be ready and we might be prepared and we might represent Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in a way that brings honor to you. So bless now, Father, in our study together, I ask with great thanksgiving, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. In verse 13, we read that we are called upon to rest our hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to us. And that's what we want to consider this morning. What does it mean to rest our hope fully upon the grace that we will receive when Jesus Christ is revealed? In order to get to that point, we need to consider a little bit, not the entirety, but we want to consider a little bit of what is in this chapter together. Peter here is writing to the believers who have been dispersed. And they've been dispersed because of persecution. And so Peter calls them pilgrims in verse 1. They are pilgrims. The King James uses the word strangers. And this word refers to one who comes from a foreign country to live in another country. And they've come to live in another country with the people who are natives of that country. And so believers, uh, we're reminded that we are pilgrims in this world. In the first century, the believers had left Jerusalem and moved out to these regions abroad and were now living there. And, and so they were to be living in a foreign land as pilgrims. But their first citizenship now as believers in Jesus Christ was their citizenship of heaven and that they were believers, citizens of heaven, children of God, and they were to represent their Savior. Well, even so, too, we are to represent our Savior, Jesus Christ, and we are looking for our heavenly home because Jesus is coming again. As we consider this, uh, a few thoughts from this chapter, what I want us to understand is that the believer in Jesus Christ is instructed by God to have a confident, healthy, biblical hope that is looking for Jesus Christ. To, to understand that, I'm going to break it down into two parts. And the first part is we want to ask, Peter looks at here, what is happening to God's pilgrims? And then the second part is we want to look at together not only what is happening to God's pilgrims, but what are God's pilgrims to do? First of all, what is happening to God's pilgrims? Well, three things that Peter mentions here that I want to draw to your attention is number one, God's pilgrims have been born again to a living hope. And number two, God's pilgrims are presently being kept by the power of God through faith. And then thirdly, God's pilgrims are grieved by various trials. So what is happening or what has happened? Well, number one, uh, Peter's writing to believers. And these pilgrims have been born again and they've been born again to a living hope. This is the same word that Peter uses in verse 23 of this chapter. If you'd look there, I'll begin in verse 22. Peter writes, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God which lives and abides forever. Peter here speaks of the believers as being born again. And he tells us that they've been born again through the seed, the incorruptible seed of the Word of God. To be born again is a one-time act that takes place when a person places their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. They receive new life. And that new life we'll see is divine life. Well, there are two parts to this, two parts. The first one is our part. We are to place our faith in the Word of God or the Gospel. And when we do, we receive eternal life. Notice here in this first chapter, verses 18 through 21, where Peter writes of this salvation in these words. Knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, 
but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Peter writes here of our salvation in the words of redemption. And that redemption is based on the work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary when he shed his blood to pay for our sins. We saw earlier in the chapter in verse 3 the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He arose from the dead. And when you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, uh, you are born again. Now God has a part in this as well. And God's part is the work of giving us eternal life. In Titus 3, 5, we read, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Our part is to believe in Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and shed his blood to pay for our sins and arose from the dead. And God's part is to take the faith of the one who's placed it in Jesus Christ and to give us new life, eternal life. And uh, this life is divine life, God's life that he's given to us. Look in 2 Peter chapter 1. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, when Peter writes his second epistle, he has these words to say, by which have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises that through these you, might, you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Peter's going to go on to talk about growing as a believer, but he talks about entering into that new life that we have, that new nature. And what is that new nature that we have received when we trusted in Jesus Christ as our Savior? It is a divine nature. It's the life of God. And, and we are rejoicing in that present blessing that we received. It's important, Jesus said, in order to see the kingdom of God, you must be born again. And so there's no part that you can have with God apart from entering into a relationship with God. And that's by means of faith in Jesus Christ, whereby we receive the new birth to be born Again, Now that's what happened to these whom Peter is writing to. He's writing to those pilgrims who've been born again. But not only have they been born again, notice now in verse 5, these also are kept by the power of God. This is what is presently happening to them. God's pilgrims are being kept by his power through faith. We've seen God did the work of saving us. It's his Holy Spirit who renewed us. And, and we receive new life through faith in Jesus Christ. And so God is also doing the work of keeping us in his Son. And it's not apart from faith. We believe what God says, and God is doing his part. His part to save us here, his part to keep us. This is blessed assurance. Turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 10. And I know that these passages are a review that we know them well, but it's important, it's well for us to be uh, reminded of them and to be encouraged. Peter wanted to remind the saints of these blessed truths. John chapter 10, notice verses 27 through 30. Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. What do we see in these verses? We see that Jesus gives eternal life to those who believe in him. Here, Jesus calls them his sheep. Peter speaks of pilgrims. Jesus speaks of sheep. And we also read, Jesus said, no one can take God's sheep out of his hand. Uh, believers in Jesus Christ are held in the mighty hand of our Savior, Jesus Christ God. So we are kept by the hand of God the Father and Jesus Christ. Because Jesus goes on to say, My Father who has given them to me, who is greater than all, 
no one's able to snatch them out of his hand either. And so we are kept by the power of God in the very hand of God. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, we read a similar expression of this same blessed truth. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Here we read, In him you also trusted, that is in Jesus Christ, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Here we read that God has placed his seal upon the believer in his own son, Jesus Christ. That is, when you trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you heard the gospel, Christ died for your sins, and that he shed his blood to pay for your sins, he was buried and rose again, and you believed, then God not only gave you, to new, gave you new life, he also sealed you. And that seal, we're told in this passage, is the third person of the triune Godhead, the Holy Spirit of God has come to live within your heart. We read in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. The guarantee that we will be kept by the power of God until the day he brings us home to heaven. Now that's blessed assurance, isn't it? We can rejoice that God is going to keep those who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So pay attention to this now. Our eternal security is a demonstration of God's power. Go back with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. It is God's power that is keeping us in Jesus Christ and will never lose us. He'll never let us go. The same power of God is on display in keeping those who believe in Jesus Christ that was on display when God created the world. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That same creative power of God is keeping his children in his mighty hand. The same mighty strength of God that was on display when God raised up Jesus Christ from the dead is on display when God keeps his children in his son Jesus Christ. God raised Jesus Christ up from the dead and displayed his mighty power and he's displaying his mighty power by keeping us in his son Jesus Christ. He'll never let us go. And what are we to do? Believe. We are to continue believing that what God has said he will do, he is in fact doing for his own glory. Number one, what has happened? We've been born again through faith in Jesus Christ. Number two, what has happened? We are being kept by the power of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Number three, what is happening? Well, here in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6, we see that in the first century, the believers were grieved by various trials. Well, they were grieved by the trials of persecution for their faith in Jesus Christ. Some of them kicked out of their homes, kicked out of their families, kicked out of their communities, even having to flee their own country. They were facing grievous trials. Well, today we are facing a crisis, a trial, and it's of pestilent, pestilence. <laughs> That's easy for me to say, pestilence. Um, now, I want to be careful here because this is no comparison to the first century. As we face the virus, COVID-19, which has become a pandemic, and it is changing our lives. That's why I'm doing these videos and posting these messages online. Our lives are being changed by this pandemic that is facing our nation. Really, that's nothing compared to what the first century believers were facing because they were in threat of being beaten, imprisoned, torn from their homes, some of them put to death for their faith in Jesus Christ. Nonetheless, we are indeed facing a crisis of pestilence. And it is an unknown, it is an unseen enemy. 
It is extremely contagious and it does have the potential to take lives. That's why there's such caution and such extreme measures that we're willing to take and that our governor has told us to take, even our president, President Trump, asking us to quarantine willingly so that we can keep the spread of this contagious uh, virus from going out of hand. Well, uh, it has the potential to take lives, especially those who have any respiratory weaknesses or illness, those who are aged and also those who have a compromised uh, um, immune system that can be very dangerous to them as well. It was interesting to me, uh, a quote by Martin Luther uh, from when he was going through a time when they were facing the Black Plague. It was deadly there in Europe. And uh, Martin Luther wrote these words at that particular time. I'd like to read them to you. Uh, again, I'm not comparing COVID-19 to the Black Plague. Uh, to this point, there's no comparison at all. Uh, and yet the words that Martin Luther said and wrote uh, are applicable to what we're facing today. Listen to what Martin Luther said. Very well, by God's decree, the enemy has sent us poison and deadly awful. Therefore, I shall ask God mercifully to protect us. Then I shall fumigate help purify the air, administer medicine and take it. I shall avoid places and persons where my presence is not needed in order to become contaminated, in order to not become contaminated and thus perchance infect and pollute others. Does that sound familiar? Uh, Martin Luther went on to say, and so cause their death as a result of my negligence. If God should wish to take me, he will surely find me, and I have done what he has expected of me. And so I am not responsible for either my own death or the death of others. If my neighbor needs me, however, I shall not avoid place or person, but will go freely as stated above. See, this is such a God-fearing faith because it is neither brash nor foolhardy, and does not tempt God. Moreover, he who has contracted the disease and recovered should keep away from others and not admit them into his presence unless it be necessary. Though one should aid him in his time of need, as previously pointed out, he in turn should, after his recovery, so act toward others that no one becomes unnecessarily endangered on his account and so cause another's death. Whoever loves danger, says the wise man, will perish by it. Those words sort of ring clear, don't they? A lot of what Martin Luther said is very applicable to us today. And we are wise, I believe, to take such measures to be careful. Well, we've seen from chapter one what has happened to the pilgrims. They were born again through faith in Jesus Christ. That's how they became a pilgrim, a sojourner, and they were persecuted for their faith. Number two, they were being kept by the power of God. Blessed assurance, eternal security. They would never lose their salvation because God is keeping them. And number three, they were in the midst of grievous trials. They were facing trial and difficulty. Now we want to see what were they to do. What were the pilgrims to be doing in the face of these trials especially? Well, number one, we see in verse 6 and in verse 8, they were to rejoice. The first things that they were to be doing, the first thing that they were to be doing, was to be rejoicing in the very face of what they were facing. And they could do that because they're rejoicing in the face of what God has done. This word rejoice, I looked it up in Strong's, concordance of Greek words and strong said greatly rejoice in verse 6 means to jump for joy think about it in the midst of grievous trials Peter is saying in verse 6 in this you jump for joy are you jumping for joy over COVID-19 we're tempted not to aren't we we're tempted to be discouraged we're tempted to be dissatisfied 
We're tempted to say, I don't really like this, or I don't want that change. I didn't want this to happen. I want everything to go back to normal. But God's word, the Lord wants us to know that even in the face of various trials that are happening to us right now, we can and should be jumping for joy. How can we do that? Well, the answer is we should be looking for our blessed hope. Nor notice in verse 7 that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory when at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We are rejoicing not only in what God has done in saving us and in keeping us, but we're also rejoicing in what God is going to do. He's going to deliver us, not just from the trials, but from this very world in which we live. Jesus is coming again, the revelation of Jesus Christ. So I want to ask the question, are you rejoicing? Are you rejoicing? You can, if you think about what God has done, what God is doing, and what God is yet going to do. God is going to bring grace to us when Jesus Christ returns to receive us home to himself. Now, in order to do that, we see here in verse 8, we need to walk by faith and not by sight. What do I mean? Well, speaking of the revelation of Jesus Christ at the end of verse 7, Peter goes on to say, Whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. With these physical eyes, these human eyes, we do not now see Jesus Christ. He's at the right hand of the Father. And yet, even though we cannot see Jesus Christ with our physical eyes, we do see him with the eyes of faith, don't we? Have you been seeing the Lord Jesus Christ work in your life? as we pray, as we're trusting in the Lord, as we're looking to Him in obedience to His Word, we see the hand of God working in our lives, but it's by faith that we see the Lord Jesus Christ in what He's doing in our life as we look to Him and trust in Him. It is a genuine expression of our faith to be looking for the fact that Jesus Christ is coming again. Our blessed hope. Jesus is coming, the rapture, to receive us to himself and to take us home to heaven. And so, it is true. Jesus is the unseen guest at every meal. Jesus is the unseen guest at every single event or happening. And I want us to be thinking about that. I want us to be remembering that as we are quarantined in our homes, who's the unseen guest with you? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you are conscious of that truth, you can be rejoicing, jumping for joy. Listen, the virus can't touch you except that God is bringing it into our lives for his purposes. If I get, if I get this virus, if you get this virus, it's because God has brought it into our lives. And God will give the grace that we might be a testimony for him. Remember, the Apostle Paul had this testimony. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So whether we die or whether we live, it is Jesus Christ who is to be honored. Would you agree with me that Paul was looking with the eyes of faith? Jesus was very visible in every single action and event in the life of the Apostle Paul. And so Paul had confidence and assurance and he had rejoicing. Remember, Later on in that same book of Philippians, the Apostle Paul said, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Number one, we are to be rejoicing, and we are to be rejoicing even though we cannot see with our physical eyes, we see very clearly with our spiritual sight because we walk by faith, not by sight. Believing we rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and full of glory because we can see what God has promised and he will bring it to pass. Number two, we see now in verse 13. Number one is we are to be rejoicing. Number two, we are to be also girding up the loins of our mind. 
Notice in verse 13, Peter says, Therefore gird up the loins of your mind and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The second thing that we are to be doing, God's pilgrims are doing, is in verse 13. Look at verse 13 with me. Therefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Secondly, God's pilgrims are to gird up the loins of their mind. This phrase is a figure of speech, and they were, in the first century, they would wear long robes, and they would, when they were ready to work or do some kind of an activity where they needed freedom, uh, they would tie up their robe around their waist, and this would enable them to run, to work, to do whatever they needed to do without any hindrance or encumbrance. Now, why is Peter using this phrase? What does he mean by that? Remember, now they are experiencing grievous trials. And in the light of these grievous trials, they're not only to be rejoicing, but number two, uh, Peter wants them to be ready, to be ready for the Lord's coming and to be ready to serve the Lord in the light of the Lord's coming. And what Peter, I believe, is saying here is he wants them to avoid panic. He wants them to avoid the distraction of the very trials that they are facing. The trials that a believer faces should not distract them from our heavenly purpose or our heavenly goal. And so we are to gird up the loins of our mind. Notice that last word, mind. And, and so Peter's talking about their thinking, the, the thoughts that they have. What Peter is saying to the pilgrims here is they need to be strong. They need to be composed in their thoughts. They need to be in a state of readiness to serve the Lord. Now that's something to consider, isn't it? Uh, we can allow the events of life that are going on to affect us so that we are incapacitated because we're full of panic or fear. Or we can compose our thoughts with the truth of God's word, with these principles that we're going to see in this chapter, focus our attention on the Lord, and gird up the loins of our mind, that is to put our mind in a state of readiness, a state of preparedness, so that we can serve the Lord. So Peter said, be ready, be composed in your thinking. The way we think about what is happening all about us needs to be dictated by the truth of God and not the emotions that I may have or the actions or interactions that people have in the world. I need to be thinking upon Christ. I need to have my thinking securely founded in the truth of God's word and have my thinking shaped by the truth of God's word so I can be composed and I can be ready. Number three, we see in verse 13 that not only are to believers gird up the loins of their mind, but they're to be sober. The word here for sober is the opposite of hysteria. We are to be stable and we are to be poised in our spirit. If we are to give in to all of the panic that's going on around us, then we are not properly prepared to be a witness for Jesus Christ. To understand that Peter's pointing out, a, a, or I should say, placing a, a high emphasis, a supreme importance upon the fact that our thinking is key to our readiness. If we don't control our thoughts, then we will be affected in the wrong direction. We need to be careful to be thinking properly. Gird up the loins of your mind and be sober. That is, be composed in your thinking and be poised and stable in your spirit. Now, how can we do that? Well, I want to remind us of what the Lord Jesus Christ said in John 16, 33. Jesus said to his disciples, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world... You will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. When we remember that our victory is in Jesus Christ, and when we remember that we have peace in him, in Jesus Christ, then we can focus our thoughts and attention on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And what do we do if we're struggling with our thoughts? Never forget Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And then God will give us that peace. The peace that passes all understanding. That peace that will guard our hearts and minds through our Lord Jesus Christ. As pilgrims, we are to be sober. We are to be girding up the loins of our mind so that we can represent the Lord Jesus Christ in the midst of all these trials or in the midst of panic and problems. The believer is to be composed and to be uh, in that place of stable poise so that they can present Jesus Christ to a world that potentially is going crazy. We want to represent our Savior. Lastly, number four, God's pilgrims are to be hoping to the end. Peter says, hope fully, rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now this word hope, I've said it before, but we've got to go over it again. We've got to remember the difference between what is biblical hope and the hopes of men. Biblical hope is a confident expectation. A biblical hope is based on God's holy word. What has God said? When I know what God has said, I can trust in his word that he's going to bring it to pass. I'm expecting God to do exactly what he said he's going to do. You got it? That's faith. And I can have hope and I trust in God's word. Confident expectation. Now that's very different uh, from the hopes of men. We do not hope like others hope. Uh, today you'll hear things like this. I hope that this COVID-19 won't really be bad. I hope that I don't get sick. I hope life will go back to normal. I hope I can go back to work. I hope I can get together with my friends. I hope that my loved ones will not get sick. It just goes on and on and on. But these hopes of men are vain hopes because they're based on the unknown. We really don't know what will happen in any of these circumstances. But for the believer in Christ, it doesn't matter what happens because we have the Lord Jesus Christ. We have him. We are in Christ. Christ is in us. And he has promised to what? Well, God's word tells us that he will be a shield to all those who trust in him. And so when we trust in the Lord, he will watch over, he will protect us, and whatever happens to us, good, bad, God will take care of us because he wants to manifest his presence and his power in the person of his son in each and every one of his children who are pilgrims here on this earth. Well, here in this verse, Peter specifically speaks that we are to hope in God's grace. Grace is God's favor. When will we receive that favor? In a very special way, we will experience God's favor when Jesus Christ comes again at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Have you noticed that this has been a theme here so far in the first chapter? Here in verse 13, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Back in verse 7, at the revelation of Jesus Christ, earlier in verse 5 we are ready to be revealed in the last time that's the revelation of Jesus Christ and this word revelation means the unveiling the unveiling of Christ and it's speaking about Jesus second coming which has two parts to it the rapture as I've already been speaking about when Jesus Christ comes to the clouds and there's a trumpet sound and a shout and there's a mighty resurrection of believers in this age, followed by uh, a catching up of those who are alive in Jesus Christ to meet him in the air so that we can forever be with the Lord. The rapture, as revealed in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. But it also refers to when Jesus returns to earth to establish his kingdom. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 4, we read, When Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. When Jesus Christ returns for the rapture, believers will be caught up to be with him to go home to heaven, and then we will return with him to this earth when Jesus Christ establishes his kingdom. Now think about that. 
there is a great hope when we think about being with our Lord forever. That's why Jesus said in John 14 to his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus said he would go to prepare a place for us and he would come again and receive us unto himself that where he is, we will also be there together with him. This is our hope. And we can confidently expect God to do exactly what he said he's going to do. Jesus Christ will return to receive him, us to himself. Well, here Peter is telling us we are to be confidently expecting that. The same thing the Apostle Paul spoke of when he said, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present age, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we see here in Titus chapter 2, God's word is telling us that we're to be looking for the rapture, the blessed hope of the believer, Jesus is coming again. It's a comforting hope. It's a blessed hope. It's a present reality. We're confidently expecting what God has said. He's coming again. Well, Peter is telling us in uh, chapter 1 in verse 13 that we are to be confidently looking for the grace that will be brought to us when Jesus Christ comes again. Well, here's what I would like to really uh, leave us with uh, this morning. What I would like to leave us with is this truth. God has told us that we are to rest our hope, our confident expectation, upon this reality that Jesus is coming again. And when he comes, God is going to give us his grace. In this world, we'll have tribulation. In this world, we'll face trials, difficulties, hardships. We are not to be panicked. We are not to be going along with the emotions and, and the ideologies and the philosophies of men uh, that would detract us from having that simple, confident expectation that Jesus Christ is coming again. And, and when we do, when we think about the fact that Jesus can come at any moment, we need to be about what the Lord would have us to do. We need to be concerned with what God wants us to do and serving Him. How can we do that? I want to give us three takeaways, three things that we can be doing this week to be representing our Lord as we face this pandemic that's going through our nation. Here they are, three takeaways. Number one, I want each and every one of you to be careful to take time daily to spend time in God's Word and prayer. Why? So that we can be properly prepared to face whatever's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen in the next two weeks, but we want to be properly, biblically prepared with a faith-based response, a confident expectation in what God has said and a mind that's believing what God has said in His Word. Take time to read Psalm 46 this week. Take time to read Psalm 27. Take time to read Psalm 40. But spend time daily in God's Word and in prayer so that we can be having our thoughts ready. Number two, I want us to look in on one another. Now that's a little bit of a challenge for us right now, isn't it? And so I want us to use the means that we have available to us. Call one another. Send an email to one another. It's very important that we check in on one another. I was blessed by Martin Luther in the face of the Black Plague to say, if there's a need, I want to be there to help. And we need to be conscious of whoever's ill or not well or needs something so that we can help one another. Number two, would you please take time to look in on one another? I want you to be in contact with email and phone calls, talking with each other so that we can be aware of whatever needs that we may have. Number three, I want us to share the good news with others of this hope that we have in Jesus Christ. I have made you aware of the COVID-19 tract that was written by Mike Brunk that we've uh, printed up that talks about the COVID-19 virus as well as the sin virus and have also printed up on our website a remedy for the sin virus. 
If you'd like to get more copies of these, hard copies, uh, we still have them here at church on the back table. And uh, if you let me know, we'll make sure you can either get in somehow to get some copies of these. And uh, you can hand them out. I've had the opportunity to hand out two COVID-19 tracts this week. And I'm in prayer that God will use this message to bring, pre to bring people who have to face the reality of death to the truth that the only hope is found in Jesus Christ. Would you be ready to share the good news with others who have no hope? I pray that we will. I pray that we'll be in God's word, that we'll be looking in on one another, and we'll be sharing the good news of salvation with Jesus Christ this week. And then call and tell each other the opportunities that you've had. I want to close this morning with a poem written by John Bunyan. It's called The Pilgrim. Who would true valor see? Let him come hither. One here will constant be. Come wind, come weather. There's no discouragement shall make him once relent his first avowed intent to be a pilgrim. Whoso beset him round with dismal stories do but themselves confound. His strength the more is. No lion can him fright. He'll with a giant fight, but he will have a right to be a pilgrim. Hobgoblin nor foul fiend can daunt his spirit. He knows he at the end shall life inherit. Then fancies fly away. He'll fear not what men say. He'll labor night and day to be a pilgrim. May God help us to be a good witness and testimony for Jesus Christ in these days. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. I pray that we will reflect upon what you have done in saving us and what you're doing in keeping us. And Father, uh, even though we are facing trials with this pandemic in our nation, yet we have the opportunity to be rejoicing in Jesus Christ. We have the opportunity to be girding up the loins of our mind and be sober looking for the Lord Jesus Christ's return. Give us your grace this week. Watch over each one, I pray, and we'll give you the thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. As we close our service this morning, if you want to, you can turn in your Living Hymns hymnal to number 423, and the ladies will play the solid rock.